Pellegrino. Perk Pellegrino. Perk Perkins, sorry. <laughs> Visconti. Present. Chinese. Present. Esposito. Present. Saudi. Cabo. Present. Basso. Present. Botello. Here. Diggs. Teicholz. Present. Riley. Here. Saracino. Here. Seabury. Here. Stanley. Here. Tabersack. Here. There being 19 present, one vacancy, one absent. Please let the record reflect that Councilman Saudi is on military leave and will be returning to, returning to us shortly. The first 30 minutes of each council meeting are reserved for uh, public speaking. I just want to remind uh, residents uh, who wish to address the council this evening, they must uh, be a resident and or a taxpayer of the city of Danbury, and they must address the council about an item that is specifically on the agenda this evening. Uh, with that, I'm going to open the floor for public speaking. Uh, and would anybody like to address the council this evening? Uh, Sam, Elise. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, I come before you again to again ask you to vote for item number eight. The parade ordinance. Please just uh, your name and address for the oh, record. Oh, Elise Marciano, 179 Long Ridge Road in Danbury. I thought you'd have it by now. <laughs> Anyhow, what I want to say about this ordinance is that last year when these impromptu parades came upon us, there were many, many people who were very inconvenienced, were caught in these uprisings, and they were panicky, they were upset, and they were scared because they didn't know what was going on. There were hundreds of people out in the main street clogging traffic and not allowing people to go through Main Street. This is not done in the United States of America. This might be done in Brazil or other countries, but it's not done here. And when people immigrate to the United States, they should observe our customs and our laws, not bring with them the unruly attitude that they can do anything they want, whenever they want, because of a silly ball game. Last year, we were subjected to several of these parades, not just one, but several of them, and there were a lot of people affected by it. Now, I understand that everybody has rights, and they have a right to celebrate a game win, but also the rest of us have the right to be able to traverse Main Street and any other street in town with the assurance that we can do that, especially when we are trying to get home or trying to get to wherever we're going without being delayed by an inconsiderate group of people who don't care about the rights of everyone else. And this is the main thing of this parade law that you have made. Is it a perfect ordinance? No. Do we wish it was more specific and stronger? Absolutely. But as Attorney Gauschalt said, we had to run it by the ACLU so that everybody's rights were protected. I am very offended by the fact that we have to even pass a law like this in this city where we have never had a situation like this before. And I think newcomers to the city have got to understand that they have the, the uh, actually they, they have the duty to look at our laws, obey our laws, and, and do what is right by our customs, not bring their own with them, and dis destroy everything that is going on in the town by these impromptu parades. Now, I, I ask each one of you, especially the ones that think that there are rights being trampled on, 
to please consider the fact that this is a start. This gives them a beginning. If we do not have any legislation that stops these people from doing this, then when will they do it, and how long will they do it, and how often will they do it? And when will we be able to, the residents, the taxpayers of Danbury, have the ability to traverse Main Street when we have to and not worry about whether we can get through or not because of some celebration that some group of inconsiderate people are having. And that is the crux of the situation. This is a group of inconsiderate people who are trampling on the rights of everybody else in the city. And if the ACLU says that this ordinance does not trample on everybody's rights, then we've got to go with it. Otherwise, all our rights will be trampled on, and where will this end? This is not a light thing. This is not something that you can say, oh, it's only a little parade. Supposing an ambulance was caught in those parades. Supposing somebody had a heart attack and had to have immediate help. How would anybody get to them? This was total blockage of the road. And I think that everybody has to consider all the needs of the people of the city of Danbury and not just the rights of a few people who want to do whatever they want, whenever they want. Thank you very much. Folks, in the interest of time, let's um, try to not to uh, have too much clapping so that we can get as much people up here that would like to uh, speak as they can. Uh, Mrs. Waller. Lynn Waller, 83 Highland Avenue in Danbury. I wanted to address number 17. Um, I'm not sure from reading the papers who pays to remove the tanks from the Roberts Avenue school. Is it us or is it the state? Uh, the school tanks? I didn't, I didn't hear you. Could you repeat? The oil tanks. Uh, it said part of the extension we had to remove the fuel tanks and I was curious who had to pay for them because that can be costly. Two, number 39. I am concerned if the Danbury Historical Society becomes an authority. Uh, won't they at that point be backed by the full faith and of credit of the city of Danbury? And whereas now they're more on their own, are we then going to have to stand behind them? And number 46, uh, clean energy. What will it cost us to sign up for the clean energy? Um, didn't we already sign up under CCM to get uh, some of the discounts with them? Program. I know it's a different program, but can you be signed up with two to get clean energy? Um, the clean energy that's on the agenda tonight has to do with our purchasing 20% of clean energy by 2010. Um, the other program is not necessarily designed, it's not re revolved, doesn't revolve on whether the energy is clean or not, it revolves around pricing and what the best pricing is. So okay. it's two separate programs. And I wanted to praise the departments that all worked on the flooding that went on in the city recently. I know a lot of guys were out there doing a lot of hard work and I just wanted to let them know the citizens in Danbury appreciate it. Thank you. So. Any other member of the public? Yes, ma'am, your hand's been up. Ten beers, ten Anchor Street. Good evening. I brought visual aids <laughs> as a teacher. Congress shall make no law respecting or abridging the right of people to peaceably assemble. Being a teacher, I think that we're getting lost in the verbiage of this amendment. So let's understand what we're talking about. The key word here is abridging. To abridge is to edit or to change. Basically, no one can change your right to assemble, period. When you say we are not taking away the law, we're just adding to it, you are changing it. When we're saying, when you say, we're not taking away the right to gather, we're just adding some safety restrictions. You are changing it. Within your ordinance, you state that this ordinance, and I quote, sets standards to evaluate the activity. That passage means that one or a few people will have the legal right to judge whether or not a proposed assembly is acceptable. 
This is not acceptable in a democratic society. That is why we have checks and balances, and this is the basis of democracy. In Article 2, you defined a public assembly as, and I quote, any meeting or gathering which will consist of more than 25 persons held on the parks or other public property owned by the city of Danbury for a common purpose that interferes with the normal flow of pedestrian or vehicular traffic. Okay. So now, we'll need a permit for a family reunion picnic at the town park. We'll have more than 25 people, we'll take up many parking spaces, we'll occupy many picnic tables. If the Jones family can't find a parking space, and the Smith family must walk around us on the footpath, will we be fined? In Article 2, you define a parade as, and I quote, any procession or motorcade which will consist of more than 25 persons or vehicles upon the streets for a common purpose that interferes with the normal flow of pedestrian or vehicular traffic. Okay, so now every funeral procession will need to file for a permit five days prior to the funeral. Let me finish by saying this. We all know why this ordinance has been created. We all know the situation that sparked its origin. But this is not the way to go about fixing this problem. The ordinance in its present form cannot work. It needs to be taken back to committee and be redesigned with a clearer intent. If you approve this ordinance, you might be opening a can of worms that you might not be able to close. Please remember two things. The right to gather is your constitutional right. No one can alter, modify, or edit it. Most importantly, how a law is intended to be used and how it is actually used can be two very different things. Thank you for your time. We see the other. We didn't get to see the other side. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks for your background, uh, 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 Salford. Honored members of the council, uh, Mr. Mayor, you have the opportunity tonight to act with exemplary courage and integrity, and I hope you will do so. At the Common Council meeting last month, a majority of the council voted to recommit the parade ordinance. They did so after hearing criticisms from many members of the public and after being offered an amendment which would improve the ordinance. The motion to, commit, to recommit was made by Mrs. Saracino, the member who has led multiple ad hoc committee uh, considerations of the ordinance and who is one of its main supporters. She stated at the time she found the amendments to have merit and wanted to see them carefully considered. The amendment, as you recall, was to increase the size threshold from more than 25 to more than 100 people, to do away completely with the public assembly part of the ordinance, and also to limit the public areas affected to sidewalks and streets. However, the majority vote was overturned when you, with the approval of Mr. Godchalk, illegally cast a tying vote. The city char charter clearly states the mayor may only vote to break a tie, not to make a tie. Now, why two people who should know the city charter more than, better than anyone else around is, uh, should make a mistake is unfathomable, but be that as it may. Now, the next day you both apologized, but I think this is one of those times when an apology is inadequate. You must also repair the damage you have done, and that's the part that takes courage and integrity. And the only way to do this is to agree to the request made by the Democrats on the council to return the proceedings to the last valid vote, namely Mrs. Saracino's motion to recommit. Now, Mr. Gottschalk, while he finds this suggestion highly equitable, he does not find uh, support for such a move in case law, the Charter, or Robert's Rules of Order, and so instead he suggests a motion to reconsider which basically revisits a motion in question and asks, do we want to look at this again? Now, I think a motion to reconsider is also at inadequate to this situation. A motion to reconsider is for something that has been duly voted on, not something where the vote itself was admittedly improper. Further, it must be made by someone who was on the prevailing side. There was no prevailing side here because the vote was illegal. So, Mr. Mayor, you must return to the last legal vote and thereby acknowledge the will of the council. There are two branches of government here tonight and you represent only one of them. Uh, <coughs> Steen Halfer, 8 Settlers Hill Road.
My name is Gregory Marciano. I reside at 179 Long Ridge Road, Danbury, Connecticut. I wish to urge all the members of the council to vote yes on communication eight, the parade ordinance. I do not believe that this ordinance prevents or inhibits anything or anybody to assemble. It just provides a safe place for them to do that and it provides safety for all those who do not wish to uh, have an assembly at that particular time, free and open access to all public um, facilities in the city of Danbury. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Betty Kugel. I live at 17 Library Place in Danbury, Connecticut. I've lived here a long time, and I just am a witness to the parade and to everything that goes on downtown because I've been living downtown a long time. On one Sunday when Brazil won a game, there must have been 2,000 people, and I am not exaggerating, between the sidewalks and the street. I witnessed uh, men uh, drinking in trucks, jumping up and down in trucks, speeding, and uh, walking. I went out to walk down the sidewalk. I was almost knocked over. You couldn't even move. You couldn't get through. I don't know what the ambulance or the fire trucks would have ever had to do if they had to get through. It would have been impossible. It was so noisy, so chaotic. This isn't a parade. This is more of, I, I think that they should celebrate their game, but not interrupt in everybody's lives and traffic. And it happened, uh, that Sunday was the worst of all the days. It was one of the first games they won. And uh, it was so horrific. I never saw anything like it. I thought I was living in a third world country, not in Danbury, Connecticut. And it proceeded for three, four other days. It wasn't as bad as that day. But I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous. So I do hope that you do vote for the ordinance on the uh, parade. Thank you. Mr. Silva. Why are you thinking? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. For the record, Joseph De Silva, 161 Main Street, apartment 5D. Mr. Mayor, I come up to speak like most of the rest of the people this evening on the parade ordinance. And it's interesting that I follow a couple of the predecessor speakers. And they spoke about the impromptu, spontaneous celebrations post-World Cup games last summer. Now, if the members believe that this ordinance will address that problem, I urge them to ask the Corporation Counsel's office if it will, because I believe they've been quoted in the paper. This will have no application to it, period. It doesn't apply. It won't solve the problem. It's not designed to solve the problem, number one. Number two, if people just noticed these parades last summer, they clearly weren't paying attention. These parades occurred in 1994, and they occurred in 2002. Specifically in 2002, they occurred at about 7.30 in a Sunday morning. At the conclusion of the parade up and down Main Street at approximately 8.30, they went to the green adjacent to the Patriot Garage. And I know that because in 2002, I lived on Mountainville Avenue, and I currently live on Main Street. Main Street, above the Palace Theater, directly in the parade route. It wasn't that bad. It didn't last that long. There was nothing to be afraid of or anything else. Mostly, however, I encourage this council to consider the amendments and the motion to recommit. This ordinance may have merit. I will give credit to the ad hoc committee that worked on it and this council that studied it. And there may be purposes for this ordinance. 
the parade post-World Cup games is not one of those purposes. Anybody who thinks so is not paying attention to what the city's own corporation council has said, number one. I also encourage you to consider seriously the amendment to expand it to 100 people for this purpose. The members of the dais, including the city clerk, make up 21. Add in the recording secretary, myself and the previous two speakers were 25, are walking down Main Street in the wrong, con in the wrong manner, could be considered, improperly probably, but could be considered a parade in violation of this ordinance. 25 is a relatively no low number. 25 is too few. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Thank you to the members of the council for listening. I live at 19 Lakeview Drive. Fortunately, I was not in the middle of this mayhem that people are talking about, so I cannot address it. All I know is that we have zoning ordinances, noise ordinances, we have many that I don't even know about that you do, and they're for the good of the citizens of the city. So this cannot be bad. It's another ordinance. You worked hard on it. If the ACLU went along with it, how can it be bad? Who can it harm? The legislature says that ignorance of the law is no excuse. So with this parade ordinance, citizens of Danbury will clearly know what they can do and what they can't do. And it's fair to everybody to do that. For that. Um, John? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. John Woodruff, 9 Madison Avenue, Danbury, Connecticut. Mr. Mayor, members of the Common Council, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. As you've heard, um, this is a controversial issue here in Danbury, and for good reason. I'm a lifelong member of Danbury, and I have had a lot of uh, positions of this body over the course of my life I've agreed with, some I haven't agreed with. I'm not sure I have ever been more frightened to be a citizen of Danbury and the United States than I am tonight, to think that we are actually considering doing what it is you propose to do, okay? And for the reason that we're doing it, we're absolutely correct. This parade and, I remind you, public assembly ordinance does not, will not, and cannot stop this kind of activity that people are complaining about. Uh, one of the previous speakers had it absolutely right. We have laws on the books. I think somebody else that's going to speak tonight is going to mention those to you. We have a half a dozen or more ordinances in place already that deal with these exact issues, from blocking the streets and the sidewalks to noise. Those ordinances can and should be enforced. This new ordinance does nothing. To create another one, all right, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Tacitus, the more numerous the laws, the more corrupt the state. We are corrupting our state, we're corrupting our city, and I believe in my heart we're corrupting it based on prejudice and racism, okay, because we don't want these people in our streets celebrating. Having said that, at the 25 member limit is absolutely, I think we can all reasonably agree, that needs at the minimum to be readdressed. Um, to say to any group, um, well, let me back up a second. It's more than parades and public assemblies. We also have to remember the, the text of the ordinance governs meetings, demonstrations, picket lines, rallies, and gatherings. Okay, this is a huge reach. Any one of those seven types of situations that involve 25 or more people are going to fall under this new public assembly ordinance. Now those of you that know Danbury history, okay, we have a long proud history of the citizenry taking to the streets to protest, to uh, exercise their right to free speech and their right to peaceably assemble. We had labor riots in the 1930s, all right, and previous during the hat strikes here in Danbury. Okay, this council 70 years ago did not see a need to pass a law to stop those. 
Okay? Doesn't need to happen now in 2007. So I would urge you, I think you did a very courageous thing, I will say that, very courageous at the last council meeting to vote to send this, recommit it, whatever it is the proper parliamentary procedure is, to send it back to committee for more work. That was very courageous. That's what needs to happen. The ad hoc committee did a, did a lot of great work. There's still some that needs to be done before this becomes an ordinance in Danbury. So I want to urge every single person on this common council, do not do this tonight. Do not just totally blanket take away the right for the people to peaceably assemble. Send it back to committee for some more work. Take out the, the pickets, the rallies, the demonstrations, you know, these types of things that are our free speech rights. Bring back an ordinance that makes sense and that'll work. And I'll be the first one up here speaking in favor of it. Thank you. Ms. Malua, you'd be the uh, last speaker tonight as we're running out of time. Robert Malua, 1 Lois Street, Danbury. Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I stand before you tonight thinking back to various events over the last year when discussions about parades have come up. This is not something new. You've been talking about it for over a year. I say it's time to act. You can talk about it all you want, but talking is just talking. If you want to be courageous, take action. So I also think about this ordinance. Leading up to this ordinance, one of the reasons is not because we had a group of people spontaneously taking to the roads. It's because in reflection of everything, and we said, what can we do about this? The mayor and the police chief, what can we do about this? It was obvious there were, very, there were loopholes, there were issues that were not addressed by existing ordinances. So the need to create something to address this was created. As a citizen, I was surprised personally that there was no ordinances regarding public assemblies, regarding parades, and I thought, okay, makes sense. Danbury has been always considered a town, small town atmosphere. It's not the case anymore. More and more it's becoming obvious that Danbury is a city. It's a small city, medium city, but we're not a town anymore. Cities need to take laws that towns do not. Also, I've come to understand that we're one of the only towns, only localities nearby that do not have a parade ordinance or a public assembly ordinance. Even New York City, one of the most liberal, I guess you can say, cities, has ordinances in place regarding parades and public assemblies. If you don't pull a petition, you will be arrested. We've seen that various times throughout the news. So one reason why I say support this ordinance is it's needed. Other places have it. It brings us in line as a city. Second, it's an equitable ordinance. Today, one group wants to do a parade, they gotta spend thousands of dollars to pay for police protection. Another group wants to do, do a parade, they go down the street, they pay nothing. Under this ordinance, you've said two things. One, the taxpayers will foot the bill for the police protection if it's during the day. But two, there's an application fee that everyone must pay. That's it, $100. You're not gonna have one group paying thousands of dollars another group paying nothing. It's an equitable fee. Third, it really is a public safety issue. Someone mentioned earlier, it's a short time. Emergencies occur in short times. Emergency is an emergency because it's unplanned. Just because it's a two minute parade does not mean that there's not gonna be an emergency. I as a citizen want to know that the tax dollars that I am paying for to support and fund emergency operations will not be hindered because personnel cannot respond in an appropriate manner. Yes, you can respond around something, but you need to know and to plan accordingly to take a different route. Or you need to have people there to block off a section to allow emergency personnel to move forward. So I ask you, please support this ordinance to bring us in a line with other communities for the sake of our public and our safety and to just to be fair to the other groups that have to pay huge amounts when other people pay nothing. Thank you. That concludes our public uh, speaking portion today. We appreciate everybody that took time out of their evening to come out and express their uh, opinions. It's certainly what our democracy is all about, so thank you for coming out this evening. With that, uh, Mr. President, the minutes, please.
Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I'd like to make a motion that we waive the reading of the minutes as all members have copies and copies are on file in the city clerk's office. <coughs> motion made and seconded by Councilman Perkins. Is any additions or deletions or corrections to the minutes as presented? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All those in favor of adoption of the minutes, please signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, signify by saying nay. I just have a motion carries unanimously. Madam Majority Leader, the consent calendar, please. Thank you, Your Honor. The consent calendar for June 5th, 2007. Three, receive the communication and confirm the appointments of Donna Ray Moore and Jeffrey F. Preston as members of the Terry Wild Park Authority with terms to expire on January 1st, 2010. Four, receive the communication and confirm the appointments of Frank M. Reed, Paul Karczewski, and Lisa Coppell as members of the uh, Commission on Persons with Disabilities. Five, receive the communication and confirm the appointment of Dr. Gregory M. Smith as a member of the Cultural Commission with a term to expire February 1st, February 1st 2010. Seven, receive the communication and confirm the appointments as alternate members of the Charles Ives Authority for the Performing Arts. Lauren Larson with a term to expire on March 1st, 1st 2010. Eileen W. Alberts with a term to expire on March 1st, 2009, and Gina Ann Marcus with a term to expire on March 1st, 2008. 16, receive the communication and approve the suspended suspense list as outlined therein. 18, receive the communication and authorize the redesignation of $480,000 in order for the Office of the Corporation Council to proceed to acquire the subject properties. 19, receive the communication and authorize the transfer of $10,000 into the uh, Fire Department Special Services account, number 2010.5052. 20, receive the communication and authorize the transfer of $50,000 into the Police Department Special Services account, number 2000.5052. 21, receive the communication and authorize the transfer of $7,000 from the Bear Mountain Reservation Reserve Fund account 2.2107 to the outside services account 12605334 as of Jul uh, July 1st, 2007. 22, receive the communication and authori authorize the receipt of fundings from the Connecticut Association of School Based Health Center Convention to enable um, Melanie Bonjour to attend the Healthy Student Healthy uh, Health Nation Conference. 29, receive the communication and approve the resolution to authorize the City of Danbury Fire Department to accept fundings from uh, FEMA for the purpose of driver training and safety courses in the amount of $132,000. 30, receive the communication and authorize the resolution to authorize the City of Danbury Fire Department to accept funding from the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation for uh, Thermal Imaging Equipment. 31, receive the communication and approve the resolution to authorize the City of Danbury Health, Housing, and Welfare Department to accept additional funds for the WIC program from the State of Connecticut Department of Public Health in the amount of $7,500. 32, receive the communication and approve the resolution to authorize the City of Danbury WIC program to enter into an agreement with the State of Connecticut Department of Ag Agricultural for funding in the amount of $736.50 for staffing at the farmer's market. 33, receive the communication and approve the resolution to authorize the City of Danbury Health Department, Department of Health, Housing and Welfare to apply for and accept fundings from the State of Connecticut Department of Public Health in the amount of $13,755 for the prevention health for the Preventive Health Care Grant. 34, receive the communication and approve the resolution authorizing the City of Danbury Department of Health, Housing and Welfare to apply for and accept fundings from the State of Connecticut Department of Public Health in the amount of $75,491.43. 37, receive the communication and uh, approve the uh, resolution authorizing the City of Danbury to accept a grant from the State of Connecticut in the amount of $91,000 for traffic signal improvements, improvements. 38, receive the communication and approve the resolution authorizing the city, of Dan the city to proceed with the acquisitions of easements for the White Street 
streetscape projects as outlined therein. 41, receive the report and approve the recommendation of the committee. 42, receive the report and approve the recommendation of the committee. 43, receive the report and approve the recommendation of the committee. 44, receive the report and approve the recommendation of the committee. 47, receive the report and refer to public hearing. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. It's a pleasure, Council. Councilman Saracino. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the consent calendar as read. Okay. Motion made and seconded. Is there any discussion about the consent calendar? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries unanimously. There are several uh, announcements that I didn't mention earlier. I just want to make the council aware. Uh, on June 28th, Ben and Barbara Shanisi celebrate their wedding anniversary. Congratulations. <laughs> June is a particularly busy month. There's a number of events that are mentioned on uh, your calendar. Please feel free to contact the office if there's anything that didn't make the list or if there's anything you want more information about in terms of best time to go. Uh, so that's uh, in front of your council for your perusal. With that, uh, <coughs> Madam Clerk, item one, please. Communication, appointment of council member at large. Dear Joe and council members, the Danbury Republican Town Committee unanimously voted to recommend Philip D. Curran, 25 Belmont Circle, Danbury, to fill the vacancy on the Common Council. Phil Curran will make a great addition to the council. Phil taught social studies before joining the fire department. As a firefighter, he rose to the ranks to become the acting chief. Phil has been active in his church, St. Peter's, and serves on the board of directors of the Salvation Army. He and his wife, Maggie, have eight children and eight grandchildren. We are pleased that he is willing to continue to serve our city. Sincerely, Wayne A. Baker, Chairperson. Pleasure, Council. Councilman Teicholz. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to receive the communication and with great pleasure approve the recommendation of the DRTC for Philip Curran to fill the vacancy on the Common Council. Okay. Okay. made and seconded by Councilman McMahon, any discussion about Mr. Kern's appointment? Mr. Giannisi. Uh, well, it would be no pleasure to have to do this. I'd like to send the refer this to the ad hoc committee. Motion is made to refer Mr. Kern's appointment to an ad hoc committee. Um, Mr. Giannisi, that's certainly within your right uh, to do that under 2-88. I would just remind you that uh, the council is under uh, a 40-day window uh, based on our uh, charter. We are beyond that window as it is versus calling everybody in the month of May. We opted to put this on the next available council agenda. Um, you will be continuing uh, us to be in violation of the city charter, but if that is your, your will, we certainly will honor your request to refer this to ad hoc. Excuse me one second, Mr. Yemen's having a uh, conversation. You still wish to send us to ad hoc, Mr. Chinesi? Yes. Wish made to refer this to ad hoc. Ad hoc committee shall consist the following. Councilman Cavo, Councilman Basso, and Councilman Visconti. And everybody can plan on being back here about the middle of the month for a special meeting. Madam Clerk, item two, please. Communication, promotion, police department. Your town council members, I am pleased to submit for your confirmation the promotion of police officer Adam B. Marcus to the position of detective for the Danbury Police Department. Adam was appointed in March of 1998 and is the recipient of several unit citations. The 2007 Chiefs Achievement Award, two exceptional police service awards, and a mayor's letter of accommodation. He currently serves as a member of the crime scene unit, the SWAT team, as a cert and is a certified police instructor. Officer Marcus is married and the proud father of three children. Thank you for your consideration of this appointment. Sincerely, Mark D. Bounton, Mayor. Your pleasure, Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to move to receive the communication and confirm the promotion of Police Officer Adam Marcus to detective within the Danbury Police Department. Motion right. made and seconded by Councilman Trombetta. Uh, any discussion about Mr. Marcus' appointment to detective? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those signify by saying nay. Adam, congratulations.
did an outstanding job in his interview. Uh, he's been an exemplary police officer, and uh, we know he's going to do an even better job as detective with the city of Danbury's police department. Adam, I know you have a loved one here. Could you introduce us? Because we're just nosy. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that we, uh, Chief, Deputy Chief Shanahan and I threw some real curveballs in terms of the questions that we asked Adam, and he uh, knocked every one of them uh, out of the park. They were very technical, detailed questions about his job and his duties, and he knew the law called, and he knew uh, what his job was. So uh, that's why he's sitting here today with his promotion. Good luck, Adam. Thank you. Uh, items three, four, and five are on consent. Uh, Madam Clerk, item six, please. Communication appointment, alternate environmental impact commission. Dear common council members, I hereby submit for your confirmation the appointment of the following individual to fill a vacancy as an alternate member of the environmental impact commission with a term to expire December 1st, 2009. Brian M. Davis, 195 Brushy Hill Road, Danbury. Mr. Davis is a self-employed contractor and investor. Thank you for your consideration of this appointment sincerely. Mark D. Bowen, Mayor. What's your pleasure, Council? Mr. Calvin. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I'd like to make a motion that we receive the communication and approve the appointment of Brian M. Davis as an alternate member of the Environmental Impact Commission. Second. Motion made and seconded by Council Basso. Is there any discussion about Mr. Davis? Ms. Conti. Thank you, Your Honor. If I may, through the Chair of the Corporation Council, one quick question. Uh, Please proceed. I, <laughs> I see that Mr. Davis is a self-employed contractor and investor. Would this present any type of a conflict of interest, he being an alternate on the EIC? Uh, Mr. Gottschalk, being the general knowledge person in the room, fire away. <laughs> the potential for a conflict of interest, I suppose, is always there. I don't know really much about the nature of this gentleman's work, but uh, we all have uh, personal connections, financial connections that might create a conflict in our duties, our responsibilities to the city of Danbury. And when those arise, you recuse yourself. Uh, but, but perhaps I misunderstand your question. If you're asking me whether or not um, th the mere fact of his uh, being a developer would <coughs> prevent him from serving on the EIC, the answer is no. The answer is no would not prevent him. Um, I don't know if I'd characterize him as a developer. I think I just want to be, I just want to be clear about that. He's, he's, uh, and Mr. McLaughlin, you did vet him. Uh, it was, is developer an appropriate to term? Well, he's a general contractor for the landscape, uh, some building, primarily outside of the Yeah, further discussion. Mr. Tabersack. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Actually, um, I caught you on um, Ivan's show, um, I think on May 10th, and you were asked a question about overdevelopment. I think you said the most important thing we can do in the city is decide who we run for these boards and commissions. It's not a problem of overdevelopment, it's who we pick to sit on our boards and commissions. And I'm concerned, um, I think you specifically mentioned real estate brokers and developers, uh, but I think that we, we need to avoid appointing people, recommending people who are tied to development, uh, whether they work in Denver or not. We'll do it when you do it. Further discussion? Seeing none then, I'll try your minds. All those in favor of the appointment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Anybody in the negative, signify by saying nay. Nay. Just raise your hand so we record your vote properly. That would be Mr. Perkins, Mr. Visconti, Mr. Shinisi, and Mrs. Tabersack in the negative. Item seven was on, did you get that? Doc? Yes, yeah, four. Okay. Got it? Okay. Item seven was on our consent calendar. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, 
Item 8, please. Communication, parade ordinance, parliamentary procedure. Dear council members, in close, please find a letter from Assistant Corporation Counsel Eric L. Gotcha, which contains his recommendations for addressing the status of the proposed parade ordinance. Specifically, he advises that Robert's rules provide for a single comprehensive motion to reconsider all four parade ordinance votes taken at the last council meeting, namely the votes on motions to recommit, amend, call the previous question, and on the main motion. In order to move this initiative forward without delay, I encourage you to move to reconsider these votes and resume the discussion on what will then be the pending motion, namely the motion to recommit the ordinance. Sincerely, Mark D. Bowen, Mayor. Thank you, Madam Clerk. What's your pleasure, Council? Councilman Calvin. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I'd like to make a motion that we receive the communication and move to reconsider item number 18 from May's agenda, including the four motions as stated in the letter. <coughs> Made and seconded by Councilman Saraceno, Mr. Rotella. Thank you, Your Honor. At this point, I would like to refer item 8 along with the correspondence. Seeing uh, that one of our members refers us to an ad hoc committee, um, ad hoc committee shall consist of the following Councilman Calvo, Councilman Basso, and how about it, Freddie? All right, Councilman Visconti. Madam Clerk, item 9, please. Communication, funds, aids, project, Greater Danbury. Dear Common Council members, as you may recall, during the budget process, there was some confusion over the appropriation of money to two organizations that provide services relating to aids. Interfaith AIDS Ministry and AIDS Project Greater Danbury both made requests for dollars under our grant agencies. Over the years, the city has traditionally funded Interfaith AIDS Ministry to help in the cause of prevention and to help with providing support services to victims with AIDS. City. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, could we just have order in the, in the chamber while we're reading this? Um, if you are talking, could you uh, politely take your conversation outside? We've got a big agenda tonight, so we want to get through it. Go ahead. The city has not funded AIDS Project Greater Danbury. However, APGD has since lost state funding and is facing a significant financial shortfall. As such, I am recommended that we appropriate $14,626 out of the con contingency fund from, the, from this fiscal year to address their funding shortfall. I have also met with representatives of APGD and have suggested that both Interfaith AIDS Ministry and APGD work together to reduce duplication of services and offer a single unified voice in addressing the needs of our community in the fight against AIDS. Thank you for your consideration of this matter. Sincerely, Mark D. Bowen, Mayor. What's your pleasure, Council? Councilman Trombetta. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to receive the communication and authorize the appropriation of $14,626 out of the contingency budget towards the AIDS Project of Greater Danbury. Motion made and seconded by Councilman Rotella. Is there any discussion about the appropriation? Uh, Councilwoman Teversack. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm glad that we're able to do this because it was confusing that evening. Uh, there was a confusion about which agency was funded and which wasn't, and I think this is a very equitable way um, to resolve it. I am concerned, though, because at that same grant agency hearing, uh, $25,915 um, that was um, appropriated for the Hispanic Center was withheld. In fact, I think 20000 went to the Red Cross and 5000 went to TBIco. So as far as I can tell, there's only $915 there. But I'm hoping, Your Honor, um, are there plans to revisit also uh, that confusion? In fact, I just met with some representatives of the Hispanic Center. They are, as you're aware, doing a search for a new director. Uh, as we agreed at the grant agency review, once the new director is set and they've done a strategic plan, they would be back to us probably end of summer, se September, um, with a request uh, for their uh, restoration of funding. A lot Thank of that you. Uh, will be up to the council to determine whether they want to do that. Any other? Uh, Mr. Shinisi. Again, to, uh, to the assistant finance director, when I was reading the request, I didn't see a certification 
letter. Can you just verify that the funds are Do we have one? available? Sure. Uh, there was one that was handed out tonight. Uh, Mm -hmm. There is a certification that uh, is in there. Okay. There is a certification from the contingency account. Okay. Thank you. And in terms of process, sometimes we'll let uh, uh, Mr. Garrick um, certify from the floor as well. We've done that in the past. But we did provide that. Thank you. Any further discussion about the donation? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries unanimously. Madam Clerk, item 10, please. Communication, line of credit for Board of Education. Dear Common Council members, the Western Connecticut Academy for International Studies Magnet School has been, has been a terrific success for Danbury and our regional partners. One of the funding challenges of our magnet school is created by first year startup costs and below capacity enrollments from partner communities. We have worked closely with our legislators to mitigate the shortfall and recently were awarded a grant that effectively halved the Board of Education's $1,270,000 shortfall. The attached letter from Dr. Uh, Pascarella, I believe, requests a supplemental appropriation of $620,000. I propose the Common Council approve a line of credit to the Board of Education, thereby allowing them to draw down on this credit as the documented need arises to fill the financial gap from the magnet school. Thank you for your consideration of this matter. Sincerely, Mark D. Fountain, Mayor. At your pleasure, Council. Councilman Diggs. Thank you, Your Honor. I want to make the motion to receive the communication and approve the line of credit of $620,000 to the Board of Education. Second. Motion has been made and seconded by Councilman Basso. Is there any discussion regarding the proposed line of credit? We're going to start with Mrs. Tabersack. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. What's the difference between supplemental funding and a line of credit? We uh, made a determination after meetings with uh, Mr. Longo and Dr. Pascarella that uh, rather than just do a straight appropriation of $620,000, uh, that we would uh, preserve a uh, percentage of uh, dollars available for the board as they work towards their close out of their books on 30 June. The idea being that they may not need all of the $620,000. If, if not, they obviously won't request it. Um, and so we're trying to work through some of those issues as we begin closing out the books. So, uh, Mrs. Saraceno. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, if I may, through the chair to Mr. Longo. Oh, please. Mr. Longo's here, and I'm sure he wants to speak. <laughs> Mayor, Council, and Linda. Hi, Mr. Longo. I, I think my question's kind of been sort of addressed, but not really directly, so I'm going to ask it directly. Uh, as you close out the books for this fiscal year, um, do you anticipate funding that you can apply to the 620000 that we won't have to advance to you? The most likely scenario will be uh, a drawdown of the full $620,000, but we did uh, work with, with the mayor to establish a liner credit rather than a supplemental appropriation as we close out the year within the next approximately 30 calendar days and going into the first and second week of July, we will close out all purchase orders on the general fund side. These are purchase orders that were established during the year that we perhaps have uh, rendered services and received services at a lesser value. Uh, so given the first and second week of July, we'll have a better indication of how much of the 620 shall remain in the city's coffers uh, and not uh, requested by the Board of Education. So, may I follow up? Please. Um, so just to, so that I'm clear, if, if in fact you have money in your general fund left at the end of the fiscal year, you would draw from that first before you come Absolutely. to the 620? Yes. Thank you. In, in the spirit of the Board of Education's work, any surplus on the general fund side would first be, would, we would apply to the operating deficit of the uh, magnet school. Thank you. Further discussion from Mr. Longo. Uh, Mr. Shanese. Again, thank you, Your Honor. Again, to uh, Mr. Lugo and maybe and also the mayor as well. Uh, when I read the 620000 the money will be drawn from our fund balance? That's correct. Okay. And in reading this, now you said you're going to draw back, draw down the 620000 what are the yards that can be paid? How, what's your repayment term? Because usually drawdown lines of credit 
have to get repaid back. Well, there's no, there's no paying back. So it's basically it's. Well, kind of consider it like a line of credit on your home, where you write checks to a certain amount of money that you borrow. If you don't use it all, you don't use it all. But in this case, uh, there's no, there's no payment or repayment that's expected. So it's really not a line of credit. Is that the term? Can is there a better term to use in a line of credit? I don't know. When I took a line of credit on my home, it, I didn't get to get it back from the bank. I had to take it. And but use again, not, again, with a, a general line of credit needs to be repaid back. That's how I understand a drawdown line of credit. So then the, the question you hear then is basically once you draw it down, it basically be a drawdown out of our general fund. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Um, one quick question, if I may, to Mr. Longo. Would you just explain, I may have missed what you were saying before, but the exact procedure that you have set in place to keep control of what's being asked for and spent? Certainly. We operate the Magna School as a special project fund. All operating revenues and expenses are accounted separate from the general fund. So we have the documentation available for every single expenditure made to date and for the remaining uh, of the fiscal, fiscal year to offer support to the Common Council as needed, as required, for the drawdown of the $620,000. We opened up the Magnus School with a operating deficit of $1,270,000. Approximately, so, approximately a month back, we received $650,000 of additional support uh, from the State Department of, uh, o, uh, sorry, OPM, Office of Policy and Management leaving the balance of the $620,000. But we do operate the Magnus School, once again, as a separate project fund uh, where we have full uh, backup and supporting documentation available for the, uh, the Common Council to review. Ms. Perkins? Mr. Longo, um, what were some of the reasons for this shortfall? Was it lack of enrollment, um, cost overrun? What were some of the reasons? And that, th th sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, definitely not cost overruns. Um, we have had um, lack of enrollment for the first year operating, to offset the first year operating costs. The optimal student mix, student mix of host districts being Danbury and sending districts, is a 60-40 split. We opened up and operated the first year of the Magnus School at a student population mix of 67% Danbury students to 23% sending district students. We were seven percentile points above the optimum mix. There is a regressive penalty from the state of for, every, for each percentile point above 60%, we are penalized at the full 2% value. So we had a reduction of 14% on state revenue. The 14% state revenue as a regressive model applies back to the first student, not for the student that placed us above the 60th percentile. Going forward for year two, we're almost at that perfect optimum mix of 60-40. We're right now enrolled uh, at 61-39. So going or entering the year two come September, we do not uh, foresee at this time any operating deficits that uh, the Board of Education uh, cannot address uh, going forward. It was mainly with startup costs and unfilled seats and lack of enrollment from sending districts. There was tremendous uh, demand from uh, Danbury families. Again, we capped out at 67%, where the maximum optimum range was at 60%. Uh, we had lack of, uh, of, of, of interest or demand from the supporting or sending districts and Board of Education. Uh, we've uh, improved, or they have improved. Uh, all the communities have uh, stepped up for the second year and have enrolled additional students by taking additional seats. Uh, further discussion, Mr. Riley. As it stands right now, uh, with the $625,000, I understand for you, so I appreciate that. Um, in the future, I would imagine the second year, the third year, you do not anticipate having Correct. And, and prior to any expansion of, of the Magnet School, which is, I understand, it's a very good thing, but prior to any expansion, naturally we would know that the funding would be there prior to any expansion. So that you wouldn't have to come back third, fourth year and say, listen, we put in, uh, let's say, six, seventh grades, and now we're behind 
$800,000. Am I, am I correct on that? Yes, you are. Uh, the, the magnet school model originated as a K-5 model. We downscaled to K-4 for the first year. We will expand to fifth grade level come September of, of, those, of this year. Uh, for future expansion, there is discussion uh, with the setting districts of the possibility to expand to the middle school uh, years as well. Uh, Ms. Rell and I have been having discussions about having a vertical integration and going K to eight. Okay. Correct. You're welcome. way to help mitigate the issues. Mr. Shinese. Uh, I'm sorry, to have to, I forgot to ask this question before. I guess the VT is the assistant finance director. Since it's going to be a drawdown type of funding, would there be a separate line item created in the budget? Okay, thank you. Since there'll be a there'll be a drawdown type of funding, would there be a special line item created in the budget and this to keep track of how much is actually being spent so we can in the, we can see it being drawn down in the numbers. So it'll be almost like an encumbered, just like a budget line item, and then it'll be slowly drawn down, or how would it be accounted for? So we need to know what type of money is being spent. That, that would still come out of the, uh, the regular line item for Board of Ed Education, and we would adjust that as needed. So basically, you're going to fund it, move the money from the fund balance to the to, to that line item as they draw it down? Well, it would, it would be adjustment to the appropriated balance. It would be a negative. So it, would, it would increase the appropriation to that line item. With the full 620? As the, as the amount is, is drawn down, you would increase the budget and, and expend the money at the same time. Well, I can say, but in the past, when that happens, each request has to be made to the council. Would that have to be done as each request is made? Or is no. it one? Big request is what we're asking. Not if you approve the full six hundred twenty thousand dollars. So therefore, you got to move the whole six twenty down. But that's what we approve. Not as you draw it down. So my question again would be that once we approve this this evening, you're going to draw the six twenty in the appropriations, basically in your accounting records. Correct. Not as it right. is it's spent, but as one big lump sum. Right. But then that would obviously be tracked individually. Welcome. Any further discussion from Mr. Longo? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries uh, unanimously. 11. 11, please. Dedication, donation to the Danbury CERT program. <coughs> your county council members, the city of Danbury lost a special member of our community on January 30th, 2007, when Eleanor Loretta Bartram, a lifelong resident of Danbury, passed away at the age of 87. Eleanor was the proud and oldest active member of the Glen Apartments Community Emergency Response Team, which is called CERT. CERT, CERT members are certified in CPR and first aid as a part of their training. Eleanor embraced her volunteer work and was a proud recipient of a Presidential Service Award in recognition of her service to the Danbury Retired Senior Volunteers Program. The Bartram family requested donations in Eleanor's memory to be sent to the Danbury Search Program. Please accept a $40 check from Beckerley and Company Host Company Incorporated in Eleanor's memory and transfer the amount into line item 2030 Five three two two, civil preparedness conferences. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Sincerely, Mark D. Bowen, Mayor. It's your pleasure, Council. Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to move to receive the communication, accept and donate the donation uh, of forty dollars, credit the proper line item, and send letters of thanks. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded by Councilman Negreshet. Any discussion about the donation? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, signify by saying nay. I have it. Motion carries. Madam <laughs> C. Madam Clerk, item 12, please. Communication, donation to the Department of Elderly Services. Dear Mayor and members of the Town Council, the Department of Elderly Services has received the following donations for the performances by both the cellmates, which is the Senior Center Band and the Senior Center Chorus from the following. 
Almost Home, 75, The Homesteads, 25, Maplewood, 30, Denbury Towers, 25, Lutheran Home, 50, The Village at Brookfield, Common, 75. Please accept these donations and transfer the above $280 into line item 5002-5601, Office Supplies. Thank you, respectfully, Susan M. Tomanio, Director of Elderly Services. It's your pleasure, Council. Councilman Eggershaw. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to receive the communication and accept the donation of $280 and transfer into line item 5002.5601 and send their appropriate letters of thanks. Second. Motion made and seconded by Councilman Ambassador. Is there any discussion about the donations? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries unanimously. Madam Clerk, item 13, please. <clears throat> Communication, donation to the Homeless Shelter Program to Mayor Marky e. Bounton and Cabinet Council. On May 3, 2007, the Department of Health, Housing, and Welfare received a generous donation of $2,000 by Powers Industries toward the operation of our homeless shelter. Please place this item on the agenda for the June Common Council meeting as this donation would need to be deposited into the HLTHDON. 465990 account. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at any time. Uh, sincerely, Scott Leroy, Director of Health, Housing, and Welfare. It's your pleasure, Council. Councilwoman Stanley. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to make a motion to receive the communication and accept the generous donation of $2,000 by Powers Industry and deposit it into the HLTHDON.4659.90 account and send a letter of thanks. Motion made and seconded by Councilman Chinese. Any discussion about the donation? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those signify by saying nay. I just have a motion carries unanimously. Madam Clerk, item 14, please. Communication, donation to the Danbury Emergency Shelter. To the Honorable Mayor Mark Bounton of the Camel Council, the City of Danbury's Emergency Shelter received a generous donation of toiletries and socks from the Danbury High School Key Club as part of one of their community service projects. This donation assists the shelter with providing personal hygiene items for individuals that are homeless and are using the day center's shower facilities. I'm requesting that the Camel Council accept this sincere and generous donation. Sincerely, Amy H. Budnick. Director of Welfare. It's your pleasure, Council. Councilman Seabury. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to make a motion to receive the communication to accept the generous gift from the uh, Danbury High School Key Club and send a letter of thanks to those students. Second. Motion made and seconded by Councilwoman McMahon. Is there any uh, discussion about the donations? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, signify by saying nay. I said motion carries unanimously. Madam Clerk, item 15, please. Communication, donation of engineering services, Lake Kenosha. Uh, dear Mayor Bounton, members of the council, Mr. Jack Houchahowski has been working with my staff, Mr. Joe Mead, in providing professional liaison services for the Lake Kenosha Commission. As you know, Lake Kenosha has a chronic problem of weed infestation that is a nuisance to swimmers and an aesthetic eyesore for residents. Currently, the State Department of Public Health will not allow herbicide application to Lake Kenosha. Therefore, we are looking for a non-chemical method to control the weeds. One of the long-term solutions we have been researching is the potential introduction of grass carb into Lake Kenosha. These carp, excuse me, these fish would feed on the aquatic weeds and gradually reduce their numbers. Grass carp has been effective at controlling weeds through state-sponsored pilot project at Ball Pond in New Fairfield, Connecticut. However, the introduction of grass carp requires a DEP permit, and they have informed us that we need to design an outlet to the lake that will prevent the escape of grass carp into the Still River. Hence, we need to retain an engineer to provide these services. To this end, Jack Kaljahowski has received an offer of donation of engineering services from Bendodo PE. Uh, consulting civil engineer to work with city personnel to design this outlet. See attached donation offer. I respectfully request your authorization to accept this offer so we can continue to work with the commission to attempt to control weeds by grass carp. 
Sincerely, Scott Leroy, Director of Health, Housing, and Welfare. It's your pleasure, Council. Uh, Councilman Calandrino. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I'd like to make a motion to accept the communication and uh, receive the donation of engineering services and send out a letter of thanks to this engineering firm. Motion is made and seconded by Councilman Visconti. <laughs> Stretching. Seconded by Mr. Cianisi. Okay. Is there any discussion about the grass carp? Yes, Mr. Visconti. <clears throat> carp eat a lot of things. They read them. I have two questions, if I may. Please go see the carp. Watch out for the carp. One, I just wondered if there was a reason that, should this have not gone out to bid or just something we can accept from Mr. Mr. Dodo? Or? That's a good uh, question. What uh, His donation is to Jack Kozahowski's consulting service, not to the city of Danbury. Okay, fine. The, the other question, if I may, um, under additional services, on the second page, 15-1, um, it states items that may be needed. Is that who would be paying for those items if, the, if they have to be needed at the bottom of the page, Your Honor? That would be the um, the additional uh, billing you're talking about. Right? Yes. Uh, hourly rate is listed. Again, that would be billed to Mr. Kozahowski's Consulting Services. Thank you, Mr. Calandrino. Here to uh, Scott Leroy. Uh, Mr. Leroy, just a quick one, Scott. Scott, the vegetation they're referring to on Lake Kenosha, is that the aquatic milfoil? Yes. Okay. I, as you know, I live on Candlewood. We have a milfoil problem. Um, is this a litmus test that might be used on Candlewood Lake one day? Uh, yeah. Um, the uh, Ball Pond experiment was a litmus test for Connecticut, which is why uh, Jack is going in the direction of, uh, and the Lake Kenosha Commission is going in the direction of uh, grass carp. So this would be another example of an application that could be used by Larry Marsicano to go to other towns if it's successful. And when will we have some indication of how successful it is? Any idea? Which? For the Kenosha project. Well, this is a feasibility study just to see if we should go forward with it. This is just to see how much it would cost, if the design is feasible, and then at the end, uh, you know, people see the second page, it would be budgeted in the future. And this could take a year or more just to see if it's feasible at all. <coughs> Thank you, Scott. I have no further questions. It's an interesting project. Mr. Perkins. Mr. Leroy, uh, sometimes systems are put into place to take corrective action. Do you know whether or not that ball pond uh, project was a success? Because sometimes, um, you know, you implement this type of project and it ends up eating larvae and small fish and other insects, except, uh, upsets the whole ecosystem. Has the ball pro um, pond project been a success? Um, from the information that I have seen at the uh, uh, Lake Commissions, uh, George Benson was the researcher and, and uh, worked with DEP. Um, as I understand it, it was very effective. Uh, DEP actually went um, so far as to say, you know, well, if you remove a certain type of weed, algae will take over, and that did not happen. So the carp were there. It did not inhibit or uh, impact the ecosystem whatsoever. They didn't leave. The, uh, the uh, mechanisms created stopped them. They didn't migrate. And there was no algae problem. So in all accounts, it's a success. And DEP probably would not even entertain this project if it was not an ex a success at all. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion for regarding the grass carp? Mrs. Taversack. Actually, it's regarding the construction of the outlet. Um, we're talking about a commission which doesn't have a budget. Um, once we have our engineering report showing the design and, and estimating the costs, what would then happen? They do have a budget. I, I think your point is that there's not, this isn't budgeted uh, in their, their dollars, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, the Lake Kenosha Commission does have a budget, and they treat the lake every year. And the problem is it's so expensive to treat the lake every year, we need a permanent solution. So they would take the feasibility study, and at the end, if it's feasible, price that out. And then I would imagine as part of the regular budgeting process or any grants that, may we, ha that we may have the opportunity to apply for would then pay for these projects. 
Thank you, Mr. Tarsley. Any further, Mr. Shahazy? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, and to uh, Scott Leroy. Um, I think I read somewhere a couple of years ago, isn't this already taking place in our city? Isn't the Rogers Park Pond, isn't there a carp in there? The top, the um, well, this is a um, identified and budgeted and permitted project. Whether or not people threw carp in there, we'll never know. I thought there's... So there's, there's natural carp, which people catch, and then there's the special carp that eat specific weeds. And that's, a de uh, that's why this project is needed has to be designed and studied to prove its effectiveness. Just uh, native carp don't specifically go after a certain weed. They eat anything, as I think somebody else said here. The carp that's in the Rogers <coughs> Park Pond is that natural carp that eats everything. Yeah, natural, and there's ornamental, but these are specifically designed to harvest the weeds that we want them to eliminate. OK, any uh, further discussion about our grass carp? Seeing none, then uh, I'll try your minds on the Item, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposition? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, item 16 was consent. Madam Clerk, item 17, please. Communication amendment to lease Roberts Avenue School. Dear Mr. Mayor and members of the council, in 2003, the city of Danbury sold Roberts Avenue School to the state of Connecticut and will continue to rent it from the state until the new <coughs> replacement elementary school is built. The city is currently reviewing bids and will award this project soon. An extension of the lease termination date is necessary to enable the city to continue to use the school until it constructs and moves into the new school. The time extension is also necessary to provide time for the removal of the underground fuel storage tank on the premise as per the city slash state lease agreement. The project did not begin as originally scheduled due to design issues. The state has agreed to extend the lease to termination date to November 28, 2009, which date is acceptable to the city. The lease has also been reviewed by the Office of the Corporation Council. Accordingly, please authorize the mayor to execute the lease amendment. Do not hesitate to contact me with any questions. Sincerely, Marie L. Corey, City Engineer. It's a pleasure, Council. Councilman Riley. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to make a motion to amend and extend the lease of Roberts Avenue School for the state of Connecticut to November of 2009. Uh, motion made and seconded by Mr. Rotella. Is there any discussion regarding the lease? Mr. Visconti. Quick question, if I may, Your Honor. Proceed. Who will be paying for the removal of the tank? Uh, I'm going to toss that one to Mr. Idrola. Good evening, Mayor. A mayor, Mr. Uh, Mr. Visconti, the original agreement actually called for the city to uh, remove the tank, and we actually were reimbursed as part of the original purchase price uh, to do that. It is a 5,000-gallon tank. We anticipate the cost to be between $1,200 to $1,500. Uh, it's a fairly new tank, so we don't think there's any associated uh, remediation work that will actually have to be performed. Thank you. Any uh, further discussion regarding the lease? Uh, Ms. Tabersack. The additional rent, can anyone tell us what that is? One dollar. Any further discussion? Seeing none then, I'll try your minds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, signify by saying nay. I just have a motion carries unanimously. Madam Clerk, item 23, as items 18 through 22 were consent. Communication request for sewer 102 Federal Road. It's your pleasure, Council. Council McMahon. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'd like to refer this to an ad hoc committee with the Director of Public Works and a report from planning. Ad hoc committee shall consist of the following Councilman Riley, Councilman Negashev, and Councilman Sadi. Uh, Madam Clerk, item 24, please. Communication request for sewer 15 Bates Place. It's your pleasure, Council. Councilman Riley. I'd like to uh, make a motion to send item 24 to an ad hoc committee, including Director of Public Works and with a 30-day report from the Planning Commission. I'm going to let you guys play with this one, too, hopefully on the same night. Uh, ad hoc committee shall consist of the following. Councilman Riley, Councilman Negershaw, and Councilman Hitsadi. <laughs> the hits just keep coming, right, Councilman? Uh, Madam Clerk, item 25, please. Communication request for outdoor patio 1 Hyde Street. 
Honorable Mayor Bowden, I would like to propose that the city enter into an agreement with Bella Luna Restaurant Cafe located at one Eye Street to use an area of city sidewalk located in front of the restaurant for the purpose of an outdoor patio. The attached diagram, SK1, highlights the area in bold. There would be approximately a six foot sidewalk remaining around the perimeter of the patio. The area would have to be divided via the use of mobile planters or fencing in order to comply with state liquor laws. I'm re requesting that you place this item on the agenda for your next meeting. I would also like to request that it be approved subject to a positive recommendation from the Planning Director and Planning Commission. If you have any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to call me. Very truly yours, Tony <coughs> Ribeiro, uh, Property Manager. What's your pleasure, Council? Uh, Councilwoman Stanley? I think you'd like to adopt the adopt the license agreement. You move that we adopt the license agreement with Bella Luna. A motion to adopt the license agreement. I think that's what you want to do. Is there a second? Sub for it? Subject to the approval of the planning director. And the Pending planning approval director. from the planning. Pending approval from the planning director. So I'll make sure Mrs. Stanley's motion was clear. Seconded by. Is that Mr. Shinisi? Or seconded that over there. Oh, uh, Mr. Trombetta. Any discussion about the uh, license agreement? Mr. Perkins. Um, to you, Your Honor, actually. Well, let me uh, answer this question. This hasn't been approved by planning yet? Uh, it does require a positive recommendation from the planning director and the planning commission. So in order for us to actually sign the license agreement, we have to uh, make a stop in planning first. Follow up? Sh shouldn't, shouldn't that be first before we... We, we can do that. Uh, we can refer it just to planning. Uh, the motion was to adopt the, the licensing agreement pending approval from planning. This just saves a step for the applicant so they're not setting up their outdoor dining in the middle of September. Um, obviously, we can't enter into a license agreement until they have approval from planning and the planning director. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves. It's Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Rotella. Through the chair of the Corporation Council, if someone could speak briefly as to liability, if someone were to get hurt on the sidewalk, is that our liability? Do we share in it? Is it exclusively the uh, proprietors? Um, in, in, especially in relation to not necessarily people that are there, but people whose, let's say, access to the green has been somewhat changed because of the layout. You can never fully eliminate the liability of the municipality. That's probably common knowledge. But the license agreement will provide, and it is a license agreement that's proposed, will provide for some protection uh, and shifting most of the liability over to the property owner. The property owner will also be required to have insurance, which will name the city as additional insured. Thank you. Good question, Mr. Rattel. Further discussion? Mr. Shanese. Thank you, Your Honor. Due to a, a personal conflict with the owner of Bell Luna, I need to recuse myself from voting on this matter. Mr. Shinesi will be recusing himself uh, due to a personal conflict. Any other discussion? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, signify by saying nay. I have it. Motion carries 18 with one abstention. Mr. Shinesi. Aye. Madam Clerk, item 26, please. Dedication affordable housing contract, Carolyn Cummins. It's a pleasure, Council. Uh, Mr. Seabury. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'd like to uh, make a motion to send this to an ad hoc committee consisting of Corporation Council. Ad hoc committee shall consist of the following. Councilman Seabury, Council, Councilman Teichel, it's good to see you back for another meeting. You look terrific. God bless you. So we're going to put you on an ad hoc. <laughs> if you feel up to it, if, uh, if it's a problem, I'm sure the Council will, it will uh, indulge you. And uh, Councilman Perkins. Uh, Madam Clerk, item 27, please. 
Resolution, Danbury Public Schools, Honeywell Energy Conservation and Capital Improvement. Much a pleasure, Council. Council McMahon. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to refer this to an ad hoc committee with the Superintendent of Schools, the Assistant Director of Finance, Corporation Council, and the Superintendent of Public Buildings. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman McMahon. Uh, the ad hoc committee shall consist of the following. Councilwoman Diggs, Councilman Stanley, and Councilman Rotella. I would ask, uh, this is a time sensitive manner, and let's get this back on the agenda in uh, July as we have new boilers to put in and a whole bunch of things. So uh, I'd ask the Council's indulgence on that. Uh, item 28, please. Resolution, bank account authorization, J.P. Morgan Chase. It's your pleasure, Council. Councilman Cavill. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I'd like to make a motion that we receive the communication and approve the resolution authorizing the city to open up a demand deposit account with J.P. Morgan Chase. Second. Motion made and seconded by Councilman Basso. Is there any discussion under this request? I'll start with Councilman Tappersack. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I'm curious as to um, the choice of banks. Was there any reason why J.P. Morgan Chase was chosen over other banks? Mr. Garrick. Um, the new dental plan is through Cigna. They have two banks that they work with, J.P. Morgan Chase and Citibank. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase uh, had better terms as far as uh, transfers um, for those benefits. So it, obviously we can hold our money longer and get a better uh, rate of return on our, on our investments. Discussion. Mr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rotella. Thanks, Your Honor. Uh, through the uh, chair to uh, uh, the uh, finance director. Dan, we're self-insured. We will be self-insured for dental as of July 1. And day. they're going to be handling what exactly? The details, the administration? C Cigna will be administering the uh, claims, and then that information will go from Cigna to J.P. Morgan Chase to cut the the checks for the claims. And they charge us per occurrence a flat fee, a percentage? How does that uh, work? There's no charge uh, from J.P. Morgan Chase. No, with Cigna. With Cigna. There, there are uh, administrative Management fees fee, built yeah. into the, the agreement with them. Are they substantial or is that proprietary? No, we actually uh, have a savings on our, our dental plan by switching to Cigna uh, from a fully insured plan with MetLife. Thank you. Further uh, discussion? And then I'll try your minds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, signify by saying nay. Ayes have a motion carries unanimously. Items 29 through 34, with consent. Uh, Madam Clerk, item 35, please. Resolution, Community Development Block Grant Program. Attaches a resolution that will allow the City of Danbury to apply for and accept funding from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for the Community Development Block Grant Program. Available funding for the time period August 1st, 2007 through July 31st, 2008. Total $654,399. No local cash match is required. A listing of the policies, committees, recommendation, recipients is attached. I'm requesting that the Common Council consider this resolution at its June meeting. Please feel free to contact me should you require any additional information. Thank you. <coughs> Memorandum from Daniel Garrick, Assistant Director of Finance. Thank you, Madam Clerk, Mr. President. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I'd like to make a motion that we receive the communication and authorize the city to adopt the resolution for the CDBG program in the amount of $654,399. Uh, seconded by Mr. Seabury, discussion regarding CDBG. Mr. Tavisak. Thank you, Your Honor. I have a couple of questions. The first is on the um, uh, second item, the City of Danbury Elderly Transit, and I believe our director is here. Um, it looks as though the CBD grant of 15000 is for um, your drivers, which we funded in our budget, uh, two drivers, uh, $10,400 each, um, which is in our adopted budget. I think we're looking for an explanation, Ms. Tomanio. Thank you, Mayor Bowden. Um, 
It was my understanding that Dina Diorio did not budget that money again this year. I'm not sure if she did or not. It was my understanding she was going to not do that. Um, her explanation was that that $15,000 was supplementary monies. So we can offer more services? Of course. Um, to uh, the chair, to um, Ms. to our assistant finance director, I, I did look at the budget that we adopted and it does include $20,800 for these positions. I mean, we did adopt it. Could the assistant finance director address yeah. that? Whether Ms. DiOrio took them out after we adopted it or? Well, I don't think she would that, take it out after we adopted oh, it. Okay. That would be illegal. So. That, that money still stands. This, this will be, supplement that, that amount for additional services. What I'm asking, Dan, is will we get a return of 15000 Because the item in the budget is only 20800 We already gave them that. So if you add the 20800 and the 15000 I'm asking, from that line item, are we getting 15000 back? No, I, no. I mean, they're, we're appropriating additional fifteen thousand for expanded elderly transportation services. So it'll be thirty-five thousand that we'll spend. I, I believe it isn't an expansion. It calls for the exact same amount of service: twenty hours, two drivers. That's the service we adopted. Mr. Wagner's here from our consultant for CDBG, and uh, Mr. Wagner, perhaps you want to shed some light. Um, it, it is my understanding that it is for supplemental services to allow additional trips during the year. Uh, salary increases for the drivers if that's approved and uh, because of the increased demand at the senior center. Uh, it would actually be inappropriate under the HUD regulations to delete funds you've already uh, appropriated and reimburse them with these funds. It would be a, a, lessening, of, a lessening of local effort, so you could, would not be able to do that. So they would have to go for supplemental expenses. Through the chair to Mr. Wagner. Um, I have that summary here. I think Sue filled it out. It says the funds will pay salaries of two part-time van drivers, $10 per hour for a total of 20 hours each. Are, are you saying that's additional service? If, if they run more trips, it could be, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Further discussion about CDBG? Uh, Oh, go ahead. Mrs. I, I did have a second question, and that was on item four, which is the ARC Dream Homes, and that is a $15,000 appropriation. And uh, uh, that item was also funded in our budget, uh, $54,500. Um, so I'm, I'm asking the same question. It appears to ask for funding for the same thing that we funded, Mr. Wagner, in our budget. Can you clarify that? Yes, as, as I mentioned before, we um, have met with ARC after they submitted this application and asked them for a detailed budget to show that these would be additional costs they have in addition to other city funding they're getting. So they're going to be doing... We received that budget yet, but they will have yeah. to show us that where in their budget this will go. Uh, through the chair. So they aren't going to be doing something new with this money? They're going to be... It, it, it will go towards their overall operating budget. I'm not sure I can say it's for something new. It's for the provision of their service uh, within the context of an overall budget that they have to operate with. I believe we fully funded them. No, Is they, that correct? They have a significant delta in their budget beyond what Danbury provides for them. The okay. objective is to draw funding from many sources, federal funding, other communities, and, and mm -hmm. city and, and state, hopefully, in the future, uh, to, to provide the services that are in their mission statement. Thank you. Further uh, discussion? I think Mr. Visconti has had his hand up. Go ahead. Thank you, Art. Um, just one item, item number uh, nine, where we're going to spend $100,000 for sidewalks on Cottage Street. There are those of us on this council who have been Wait, wait, wait. That's not your ward. <laughs> Whose ward well, is that? Four comes to be from five, so I can still go that way. Let's take it out of there and give it to <laughs> Freddie. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Fred. I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought now. Um, there are those of us in this council who have been trying for quite some time, and, and you are aware of it, to get something done on the southern end of the city, like a streetscape. And I, I understand it was money that had been put aside through the bonding issue, I believe, 
Your Honor, if I'm wrong, please correct me. And I'd just like to know what happened to that money. And Cottage Street is a nice little street, and it's got a nice little church and so on and so on, but why are we going to spend $100,000 for it? Well, I'm not sure, um, let me just address this later in one second. I'm not sure about the bonding money you're referring to. Uh, if you're thinking Southern Boulevard, is, is that? No, what, I'm, what I'm saying, no, 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 Your Honor. What I'm South saying from Mountain Street up, which was supposed to be South included. Main? Yeah, South Main. Oh, that's, th that's a totally different program. That's T21 money. I'm not sure what they call it now, but it, they, they have a new name for it. We're still in the hopper. That's applied through HEVCO, uh, and we're second or third in line now for funding there, much like we did North Main Street. Uh, then we leverage state dollars along with federal funding uh, to do the work just like we did on North Main Street to do a similar kind of streetscaping. So two separate pools of money that we operate out of. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we, that project is very much a, a go. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Basso. The Danbury Housing Authority of Mill Ridge will be doing site improvements. Uh, cleaning up some uh, brush that is become presenting a security problem, security lighting, uh, things like that, <coughs> landscaping, basically to clean up that neighborhood. So. Further discussion about CDBG. Mr. Shinies. Um, what is item 16, interim, interim assistance? What's that used for? Um, I actually teach this for HUD, so, so it's a three-day course, so I won't go too far. Um, interim assistance is something under the regulations which allows a community to provide interim assistance to designated low and moderate income neighborhoods for one-time occurrence events. For example, an emergency snowstorm. That's a declared emergency. In the past, we've actually used these funds uh, as part of the funding for the to offset the city's costs, but only in those neighborhoods of the city designated by HUD as low and moderate income neighborhoods. Uh, so it can be used for a variety of things under those kind of categories. Not routine uh, trash pickup, for example, right, but it could be used for, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so if you went back every year and said, we're going to put money in interim assistance for trash pickup every year in a neighborhood, we can't do that. But periodically, yes, we can, and we have done that. So for example, um, I know, for example, on oil mill behind there, there's a railroad track that's full of garbage. Could that, this money be used for something like that? Probably not. Would clean up oil mill is that? not in the catchment area. Right, it's not. That they want. You have to be in the catchment area. That's oh, right. So like the Blind Brook, something like that? Blind Brook yes. may qualify. Blind Brook, yeah, Blind Brook would. Sidewalk we actually stuff. have used it on Blind Brook to do trash pickup several years ago along the brook itself, yeah. But again, a one time, you would, we can't do, go back every year. HUD, because HUD under this law prohibits maintenance activity. So if it can be perceived as maintenance, in other words, you're going to go back every year, that would be ineligible. But a one time cleanup or a special cleanup could be. And we've done that in several cases around the city. So. One more question, Your Honor. Item 18, general admin, what's that used? I'm sorry? Again. General administration, I guess that's what it is, general admin, by 19. That's everything from uh, procurement and advertisement, um, um, the management of the activities, the monitoring. Public uh, notices. Managing the overall program. That's the city to use. Oh. It's uh, fees associated with it. It's advertising cost. It's uh, reimbursement to the city for some of its staff. So just a variety of different expenses. Um, associated with operating and managing the program that HUD requires. Okay. Mr. Perkins. Through you, Your Honor, uh, to Mr. Wagner. Uh, activity number 16, the interim assistance, could something like that be used for, let's say, uh, Jennings Park? No. No, yeah, no, recreational facility. Do you mean to, to rebuild? No, it's, it, it's a mobile park, but it's not in the cash well, area, Larry. No. Thank you. Hotel. Thanks, Your Honor. Through the chair to Mr. Wagner. Uh, item 14, slum and blight re remediation. I think if those funds haven't entirely been allocated, I think in response to Councilman Genese's request along the Still River, the banks, there's some old washing machines and tires that have been there for 30 years. This would not be under recurring maintenance. It would be a one-time deal to get some of those items out of there. The, the, the issue is there's no roads. You have to bring a machine onto the train tracks to pull stuff out of the machine in, a, uh, uh, in collaboration with Houston Valley Railroad to get that stuff out of there. So. We can certainly look at that for the definition, but what you may perceive as a community of slum and blight doesn't always meet what HUD defines as the definition. HUD has two definitions for slum and blight. One is slum and blight on an area basis where a city, where a city designates an area as a slum and blighted area. It has to meet certain criteria of a certain number of residential units, 
a certain percent, or over 51 percent, have to be determined to be deteriorating and declining. Um, so, so that, you know, it's the old urban renewal approach. A slum and blight on a spot basis uh, can be the uh, deteriorated house that could be demolished or rehabilitated if it's determined that that uh, property is detrimental to public health and safety, but only those items to remove the condition detrimental to public health and safety could be addressed. Yeah, we can so, talk about this, maybe. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Any uh, further discussion related to CDBG? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries unanimously. Madam Clerk, item 36. Resolution, Main Street North Street Estate Project. To the Mayor, uh, Mark Fountain, members of the Town Council, from Dennis Elburn, Planning Director. We are closing out our account with the State Department of Transportation regarding the Main Street North streetscape project. The initial agreement was approved by the Town Council in 2002 with a supplemental agreement approved in 2003. We are asking your approval of the second supplemental agreement which calls for an additional municipal appropriation of $5,320. These funds are to cover unanticipated utility costs related to utility poles and a gas line. The total construction cost of the project is $1,205,600, of which the state is responsible for $964,480, which is 80%. And the city is responsible for $241,120, which is 20%. Of the total, utility costs equal $39,600, for a municipal share of $7,920, 20%, of which we have already deposited $2,600 in the first supplemental, hence the balance of $5,320. Copies of the supplemental agreement were received from the Department of Transportation today, May 29, 2007. They are requesting signed copies to be returned on or before June 29, 2007. <coughs> We regret the short time span, but given the factor and the relatively small amount of funds involved, we request this item be placed on your consent calendar for expedient action. Your cooperation is appreciated. It's your pleasure, Council. Councilman Calandrino. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I'd like to make a motion to approve the resolution requesting the second supplemental agreement calling for additional appropriation of $5,320. Motion made and seconded by Councilman Johnson. Is there any discussion about this project? Ms. Saracino. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, through you to Mr. Uh, Garrick, please. Garrick. Um, there, there was no certification accompanying this, so my question basically is where, where is the money coming from and how are we going to account for it? That, that all comes from uh, account line number 1220 <coughs> Professional Services under the... And, and that money is there presently? Yes, Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, signify by saying nay. Ayes have a motion carries unanimously. Item 37, 38, we're consent. Uh, Madam Clerk, 39, please. Ordinance, establishment of the Danbury Museum and Historical Society. Honorable members of the council, dear council members, I am very pleased to propose the creation of the Danbury Museum and Historical Society Authority to serve as a control and management entity for this great local institution. As you know, such an authority can be established in accordance with the provisions of state law and in a manner intended to serve the community as a separate body and in accordance with procedures which, with which you are aware. Please also note that it is not expected that any new funding will be required at this time for the establishment of this authority, nor its forward operations. Kindly receive and review the attached ordinance and take the usual action to permit its consideration. Thank you for continuing to help make Danbury a wonderful and exciting place to work and live. Sincerely, Mark D. Fountain, Mayor. It's a pleasure, Council. Councilman Diggs. Thank you, Your Honor. I want to make the referral to an ad hoc committee with a representative from the Mayor's Office, Corporation Council, Director of Finance, and a representative from the Danbury Museum and Historical Society Authority. Uh, 
Uh, ad hoc committee shall consist of the following. Consist of the following: uh, Councilman Calandrino, Councilman Johnson, and Councilman Esposito. Madam Clerk, item 40, please. Ordinance Rose Hill Avenue Bridge. It's a pleasure, Council. Councilwoman Basso. Seeing no objection, it is so ordered. Items 41 through 44 were consent. Uh, Madam Clerk, item 45. And that would be. Uh, 45 is an ad hoc report, senior energy assistance. Pleasure, Thank Council. Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Your Honor. I move to receive the report. Approve the recommendation of the committee And refer to public hearing. Let's go to public hearing. Any objection to sending this to public hearing? Seeing none, then I'll try your mind. So, excuse me. Seeing no objections, it is so ordered. Madam Clerk, item 46, please. 46, and have report, clean energy. It's a pleasure, Council. Councilman Cavill. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt, receive the report from the committee, adopt their recommendations, and waive the reading of the minutes. This is made and seconded by Councilman Basso. Any discussion under the clean energy report? Councilwoman Tabersack. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I had a couple questions. This is not going to a public hearing? It's just a, it's just a resolution. Mrs. Tabersack said it does not require a public hearing. Um, in our, uh, through the chair to the Assistant Director of Finance, in our 2007-8 budget, there, there is no percentage dedicated to clean energy. Is that correct? Not directly. Not directly? Related to this. <laughs> I mean, there's obviously an energy line, uh, and that has been budgeted for. And um, we have until 2010, uh, and it's non-binding. Is that correct? Correct, correct. Uh, if I could, through the chair, can you hazard a guess at what our clean energy would do to our bills, our appropriations for energy? Do you expect they'll go down? Not immediately. Uh, it was actually discussed at the ad hoc committee. That would add, uh, I believe it was 1.4 cents per kilowatt hour for generation. Um, obviously, with uh, the price of oil, and uh, that's driving um, the cost up for utilities, for those utilities that use uh, oil uh, for generation. Uh, so in the long run, this, you know, they're predicting that this will actually cost less money. We'll obviously look at this throughout the year as we add, uh, you know, as we switch over uh, buildings to uh, clean energy to make sure that we stay within budget, however. Um, and to the chair, not, not to our finance director, it, it appears as though there's sort of an obligation on the part of the city to encourage residents and businesses to also sign up, but it's incentivized, as I understand, that for every 100 people who go to clean energy, we get solar panels? That's correct. Through, uh, through the chair, is there a particular entity or person who would try to encourage that incentive to happen? Well, we'd like to do two things. One, we'd like to uh, host uh, several seminars through the next fiscal year about how to buy energy. Uh, there's a lot of discussion now on the open market since it's been de deregulated. A lot of our seniors aren't really sure. That they don't even know they have options besides Northeast Utilities. So that would be one piece of it. And then the second piece of that would be um, a discussion about clean energy and encouraging people to enroll in the program. I think the numbers were, and I, I, I was only here for part of the committee. I know Mr. Calandrino is here, but I think the numbers were around, there's a hun roughly 100 people that are already on clean energy in um, Danbury. And obviously, we, as we grow that number, and uh, those numbers will count, too, towards our total count for solar panels. But as we grow that number, hopefully we can uh, educate people about going green, uh, even in their homes. So th we'd like to do a public outreach campaign uh, and do some seminars for residents about how to purchase energy. It's a very complex uh, process. And through the chair, it sort of indicates that they will um, reimburse renewable energy installations up to a cost of $4 million so that we could put windmills at the landfill. Sure. 
but is that is that correct? Up to four million dollars? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Any further discussion about this report? Seeing none, then I'll try your minds. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All signify by saying nay. I just have a motion carries unanimously. Item 47 was consent. We do have an executive session scheduled. I'm going to ask uh, the President of Council to move item 49 above 48 so we can do our department reports and then uh, staff can uh, get home. Mr. Cavill? Your Honor, thank you. At this time, I'd like to make a motion that we move item 49 ahead of 48 for the benefit of the staff that's here this evening. Um, second. Motion made and seconded by Councilman Shinisi. All those in favor of moving 49 ahead of 48, signify by saying aye. Aye. All signify by saying nay. I just have it. Uh, Mr. President, the department reports. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I'd like to make a motion that we wa waive the reading of the departmental reports as all members have copies, and copies are on file in the city clerk's office. Was made and seconded. Is there any discussion on department reports? Uh, we'll start with Mrs. Saracino and work our way around the Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just wanted to take a, a personal moment here to thank the folks in uh, the Public Works Department, particularly uh, Mr. Corey and Mr. Idarola. Um, several months ago, I had asked um, if we could put a sign up in front of the old Great Plains School to identify it. And uh, these gentlemen worked very hard uh, to make that happen. And the sign is now installed, and it looks wonderful. And I just want to say thanks very much uh, for doing that. Thank you, Councilman. Mr. Rotella. Uh, thanks, Your Honor. Um, pre the May tornado, uh, I'd like to commend the Public Works, Fire Department, and the police not only the amount of work they did, but how fast they did the work. Case in point, I got a telephone call about a tree that came down in the 6th. I might even know who owned that tree, although I'll keep that under my hat for now. By the time I called the police, they were already on scene. And this was at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. There were wires down on Park Avenue. They had made a, uh, a friendly response to Ridgebury because of the tree that came down on the bus. There was a tree at the base of Oeyata that couldn't be removed, unfortunately, and that's a cul-de-sac. Um, but they were aware of that, and since people were lighting that evening with candles, the risk of fire was elevated, so they were on top of that situation. They did a commendable, fast, safe, effective job, and uh, I'd just like to say thanks to, to all those departments. Well said, Councilman. Further discussion on department reports? Uh, Mr. Cabo. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I'd like to just um, congratulate Mr. Leroy and Ms. Monjour on her achieving the ability to go to the National Conference for the School-Based uh, Healthy Students, Healthy Nation. Great job on that. And to Your Honor, for I understand you received an award last week. I uh, have a report on this agenda, so you can't uh, mention that, but I did. I, I was say uh, you received an award on uh, his uh, advances on homelessness in the region. Thank you. Further discussion on the department reports? Seeing none then, all those in favor accepting reports, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those signify by saying nay. I just have a motion carries unanimously. We're going to ask the room to clear. Mr. Cobb, will you make a motion, please, for executive session? Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I'd like to make a motion that we go into executive